And good afternoon, everyone. It's April the 11th, and we've got our um, uh, regular agenda setting conference uh, for April 11, 2024. I will call uh, this session of order, and I would uh, call on Vice Chairwoman Tony Stewart for the invocation and the pledge. God, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your compassion, God. We thank you, God, for each and every person that's represented here today, God. We thank you, God, for the commissioners, God, and for choosing us, God, to serve this community, God. I pray that you would give us wisdom and insight, clarity and guidance. We pray for every um, citizen in Cumberland County. We pray for every director, every supervisor, every employee, and everybody that encompasses the great county of Cumberland. Pray, God, uh, for strength, health, and peace in our community. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right, that will take us um, to the uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, Mr. Manager, do you have any changes to the agenda? We will need to add a closed session, Chairman Adams, under uh, paragraphs 3 and 5 of the NCGS 143-318, you know, paragraph 11. Okay, we will add that on. We also, um, I don't know if y'all saw it on there, there was a... Uh, uh, also a uh, theme for presentations, so we will put that uh, right after the uh, approval of the agenda. So that would be, uh, we'll make it 1A, if that's okay. If I can get a motion to approve the agenda with those changes. Seven. Second. Okay. It's been moved and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. All right, thank you. Um, if it shows that Commissioner Boos is here and Commissioner uh, Jones is here, uh, Commissioner um, Council is on her way, and uh, so uh, we'll get started. Uh, I will tell you that, uh, and I know Commissioner Keith always, he, he gets me because I always talk about uh, Meals on Wheels, and uh, and uh, always try to put some extra money in there for Meals on Wheels. Uh, I, it's, it's interesting enough that um, as we talk about this, and I look at a lot of PBS and NC Impact and all that stuff, is that we think about Wheels on Wheels, but they say it's so much more in terms of being able to touch these people uh, when we go out. Because some of these folks have no other contact with anybody except for those individuals. And so I was talking to Miss Lisa Hughes, who is um, uh, the director of the Council, Common Council of Older Adults, where Wheels on Wheels uh, resides. And I was telling her what well, it's a great program. And she told me, I was so limited. And she said, we do so much more than just uh, Meals on Wheels. And uh, so I said, OK, well then, come and tell us about Meals on Wheels. So Ms. Lisa Hughes, if you come and uh, tell us about the Cumberland County, um, County Council. It's our Cumberland County, too. Council of Older Adults, uh, Ms. Lisa Hughes. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, Chairman Adams and fellow commissioners, I uh, would like to thank you again for this opportunity to speak in front of all of you today. Uh, as Commissioner Adams said, my name is Lisa Hughes. I am the Executive Director with the Cumberland County Council on Older Adults. Uh, the great work that the Council on Older Adults does would not be possible without strong community backing. And so first and foremost, I'd like to thank you all for your support, uh, both through advocacy and funding and helping us to fulfill our mission. Uh, although I have been with the Council on Older Adults for 10 years, I've actually been the Executive Director for only the past eight months. However, the Council has been serving seniors of Cumberland County for 55 years. The agency's mission is to help support seniors living independently in the community with dignity, and we do that by providing a whole host of supportive services. And as uh, Chairman Adams said, most people think of our agency as Meals on Wheels, but we provide so much more than that. So I want to just take a few moments to let you know a little bit about what else we do, and then speak a little bit more about our Meals on Wheels program, and as he said, uh, more than the meal that we provide through that program. 
so our agency, like I say, not only provides uh, support to seniors, but also to the community at large. And one of those programs is with our information and assistance. When folks don't know where to go to get help for their seniors, their loved ones, they can call our office and get access to not only the services that we provide, but also information on community resources available across the entire county, statewide resources, and national resources as well. Our information and assistance program is the entryway into our agency, into our services, and into the resources here in the community. We also provide support right in the home with in-home aid services, helping out with personal care. And as a nonprofit, providing that service at no cost is a really big deal for seniors who have a very limited income, and a service like that costs a lot of money. Also, home improvement services, we focus on accessibility, so making sure that folks can stay in their home but get into and out of their homes safely and move about their homes easily and safely. We also provide our Medicare counseling. It's important when folks are of age that they have Medicare that they understand what their insurance looks like, so we help out with that. We also support our seniors' mental health by making sure that they have that social connection, that connection with the community. We provide volunteers that make phone calls and go out and visit our seniors. And not only with our Meals on Wheels program where maybe that's the only person that they see, but that volunteer that they're connecting with may be the only person that they talk to all week long. But they have that connection with the community, that connection with our agency and other resources so they can remain in their home safely and independently. As I said, not only do we provide supports to our seniors, but our caregivers. When I left my office, I had just left a caregiver class, powerful tools for caregivers, making sure that our caregivers in the community are taking care of themselves so that they can care for their loved ones and keep them in their homes. We also offer support groups for our caregivers, and we're expanding these services all the time. And then that education for the community as well, not just about the services that we provide, but we also talk about dementia, making sure that folks understand what dementia is, what resources are available. We talk about brain health and wellness. So that is so important. And also providing memory screenings for individuals that might be tough sometimes to get at the doctor's office. It might be a little bit scary to go into the doctor's office and have that appointment, but you can sit down with me, get some information, learn a little bit about your brain health. So those are some of the things that we provide. Like we said, though, probably one of our most requested programs is our nutrition services. Our nutrition services is not just Meals on Wheels, though. It's also our congregate nutrition program. We have five sites across the county that provides a hot lunchtime meal Monday through Friday for seniors within the community if they can get out to those sites. So not only are they getting that lunch, but again, also that connection with other people. They're getting education about nutrition. They're just having the opportunity to fellowship with other individuals. For our seniors who are unable to get out, of course, Meals on Wheels is where we step in and help out with that. That lunchtime meal, Monday through Friday, that's provided either for, through one of our many volunteers or one of our hot and cold delivery trucks. We now have three trucks so that we can serve more of the county. And we cover the entire county. I heard Commissioner Adams talking about Beaver Dam. We're trying to get to every corner of Cumberland County to try to serve these seniors. I do want to say, though, that we are currently serving 432 seniors through Meals on Wheels. However, the need within the community is far greater than what we can serve both through funding and volunteer capacity. Our wait list currently stands at 481 seniors. This past year, we were able to add 100 seniors onto service through short-term ARPA funding, the American Rescue Plan Act funding, through the Mid-Carolina Area Agency on Aging. That funding is, of course, time limited, which means if we aren't able to access funds to continue serving those individuals after those funds run out, they no longer receive the benefits that that program is providing and our wait list grows to nearly 550 folks. When we talk about what the benefits are of that program, I want to share with you a story about one of our clients. She had been... He likes to hear the stories. He wants to hear the success stories. Excellent, excellent. So one of our clients had uh, been of ill health. She had Meals on Wheels before she went to the hospital, but she went to the hospital, she went to short-term rehab, and she came back home. Our driver was delivering her meal. She had been home for two days. The driver went to deliver her meal, and there was no answer at the door. However, the driver could hear her inside, could hear her calling for help. 
this individual had no other family members, no other support persons available. So that driver coming in to deliver that meal that day meant that she was able to be found that day. The driver stayed at the house, called 911, until someone came and made sure that she was taken care of. Again, if that driver had not been delivering because of her limited support, there's no way to know how soon she would have been found or if she would have been found in time to get the medical help that she needed. And that is just one story of many stories like that. As a matter of fact, that driver has had to call 911 more than once, having found their client either un unavailable to answer the door because they were on the floor, because they were having some kind of a medical emergency. So when we say that Meals on Wheels provides more than a meal, that's exactly what we mean. They are not just getting that lunchtime meal, but they're getting that social connection. They're understanding that there's others in the community, even though they don't see them, that cares about them. They are able to access resources available that we can connect them with because they have that connection with the driver and back to our office. So that program, as many of our programs, really do provide more than just what you're looking at. You look at our brochure and you can see that here's this program and it provides this benefit. But the breadth of support that each of these programs goes well beyond what that little description talks about. I also want to just take a few moments to mention that April is National Volunteer Appreciation Month. Our agency has over 270 regular volunteers. We could not provide our services without our volunteers. They help deliver meals. They help build ramps. They're the ones making those phone calls and doing those visits into the homes. They're helping people understand their Medicare. They're helping clean out yards and so much more. At the end of this month, on April 24th, we're actually having a volunteer appreciation event. Because of COVID, we've not been able to do that for a while, but we are excited to get back and show our volunteers how much they mean, not just to our agency, but to the seniors and to the community at large. So to each of you commissioners, I welcome you to join us for that event. Come and have lunch with us and let those volunteers know what they mean to Cumberland County. And again, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak here today, to introduce myself, to let you know a little bit more about the Council on Older Adults, and I welcome an opportunity to talk again, to speak one-on-one, -on -one, so we can make sure that all of our seniors, our caregivers, and our community are taken care of. Uh, Commissioner Stewart. There are 481 people on the wait list. How do they move up? Do you have a max that you're able to serve, and then we do. it falls off and someone come up? What is that? <laughs> we do have a maximum that we can serve, and it depends on what our funding looks like each year. So okay. we're usually looking at usual funding. We're looking at about 400 people because we've had additional funding because of COVID. We've been able to serve more folks, but we have to consider our funding and our volunteer capacity. We have more volunteers that are reaching out all the time that want to help support the community. However, the referrals that come in probably outpace the number of volunteer requests that we have. What, is there a um, people that may qualify because they need it right now or does everybody fall on the witness and just one move out the way and then one moves up? Stop. Sure. Kind of how do we triage folks, right? So if we have space to add someone, uh -huh. and when we get those referrals, and that referral comes in through our information and assistance program, it goes to our program director, who's going to take a look at what's going on. She gets a little bit of a, a brief description of that client's situation. If it's an urgent situation and she has the ability to add them on, she's going to go out, do that home visit, assess what's going on, and try to get them started right away. However, we are limited by our funds, particularly, and our volunteer capacity to some extent. So we are doing our best to kind of triage through the needs of the community, but as you probably can guess, 480 individuals, that can get tough to do, so. My last question. Please. My last question. Um, so out of your 432 seniors that you're now serving, does that include the in-home service, the um, all time, all high, the four, all timers. The uh, 432 is just Meals on Wheels. Oh, okay. We serve okay. hundreds and hundreds more between all of our other programs. Our in home aid services alone, we serve about 75 individuals. My caregiver supports, I probably have 200 individuals that I'm regularly connecting with with our caregivers. Is there a cost? 
There's no cost for any of our services. Okay, thank you. No, ma'am. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Commissioner Booth. I sometimes can't read my own handwriting and might have to take notes on the brochure here. 1968? I knew it was one of the programs, but I didn't know who, who thought it up. I mean, was it, was, I don't know, was it a county or was it someone like you that had a, uh, an elder relative and said, Isn't there, you know, if you all give me money, I'll go take Uncle Fred's his meal or something. I mean, how did it start? Sure. So it started back in 1968, kind of with a focus on how do I connect the seniors and volunteers in the community? It was my understanding just a small group of individuals who came together and put this nonprofit together. Um, one of their big focuses was the opportunity for volunteers to connect with seniors and help them out. So we are actually going back to our roots of when that, when our agency started and the slogan was, we need you for the volunteers, and that's what I'm letting my volunteers know. We need you. We can't do this without you. On the mental health screenings, are those annually? Does, is everyone required to do it, or does like a family member or a neighbor have to say, Tony's coming out to check our mailbox uh, with just your shoes on? Sure, sure. <laughs> So I'm going to refer to Mr. Booth here at that age. But <laughs> <laughs> I qualify for all your stuff. 60, 65, I'm, I'm, those are in my rearview mirror. But um, sure. I've had family members uh, with it, and there's now a whole lot of stuff in addition to medications that mm -hmm. give false, like false positives of dementia and Alzheimer's. There's yes. a uh, lack of being able to watch Jeopardy. I mean, really silly stuff, but no mental stimulation, no physical stimulation, no walking around the block. So if somebody has some medical conditions and, you know, doesn't have someone to talk to or, you know, mm -hmm. fuss mm -hmm. with or something like that, that also is it. So the, the interaction, I think, is huge. I don't think everyone even knows the benefits of that yet. Yes, definitely. Uh, so as far as the answer to your <laughs> question, the memory screenings, they are provided at any time. I encourage folks to get them done once a year for folks who are on Medicare. That should be done during a wellness visit. However, I'm finding that it's often not. And I think sometimes folks get a little bit more concerned when they're sitting in a doctor's office doing that kind of thing. So when they can come to my office and do that memory screening. And it is not a diagnostic tool. It is just an informational tool to let folks know kind of where they stand. Okay. And one last thing. Uh -huh. We, we, the rules are always changing. It's like trying to swat a fly in a room on what is ARP available, what is different programs, state programs. You know, uh, is there anything like it's a hard item? What, what I think is going to be is a crashing end is when people have used ARP money to hire 20 new people. And in three years, you're not going to say, go home. Mm -hmm. And that's going to mean some of these people here are doing tax increases and stuff to keep people on. Mm -hmm. Do you need like new vans? Does everybody, does everybody have a help I've fallen and I can't get up but I mean hard items, you know, the... Um, sure. The biggest thing that we need funding... Nobody's going to say they don't want any money, but they want I'm just saying... I, 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 It's meals. It is providing those meals to our seniors. That is what we need. I don't need additional staff to be able to do that necessarily. I'm working on getting more volunteers in the community, but we have some more capacity there. But if I don't have the money to buy that food, I can't serve those folks. Do, do we have the, the go-ahead or the sanitation ability to have uh, like branding and serve that? At the end of the day, they may have 10 steaks that, they, that they've just cooked or are ready to cook, and they're going to throw them out. I'm not talking about they, clear, all, I'm not talking about clear the table. They actually use a company. We do. Uh, we do. We a are a company that mm -hmm. does this all over the state. Okay. Right? Yes, okay. we are required state standards, that require that? that we have very specific guidelines that we have to follow, mm -hmm. so we contract for the local caterer to provide our meals. Okay. Mm -hmm. all right. See you soon. <laughs> Commissioner <laughs> Jones. <laughs> <laughs> My question is in reference to your in-home in um, aid services and yes. your home improvement services. Uh -huh. Two questions. Are those um, income-based, number one, in reference to the in-home 
aid services? Are those CNAs and do you all partner with someone? Sure. So the answer to the first question is there are no income requirements for any of our services. Um, it is a question that we do have to ask whether or not someone is above or below the poverty level. It simply is an answer that goes into the state database. It does not impact whether or not we provide the service or not. As far as the in-home aid service, we currently provide some in-house services and then we subcontract with five different uh, companies. As of October, we will actually be going completely subcontract with other companies to help save a little bit of money, spread that money so we can provide more service. Commissioner Keith. Um, I just had a question. Every time I, I hear that there's a waiting list, it always, it, it always kind of concerns me mm -hmm. from a number of different aspects. Either it, we all know that in government programs, the, the difficulty in some, of the, some government programs, no matter if you're talking about physical health or mental health or social problems, that some of the people who really, really need the service more can't get it and some people that it's just a convenience for the service do get it sure and i'm sure we have that you know at what level i'm sure in your organization too and to commissioner stewart's question a little while a little while ago um how many times a day if someone decide on the meals on wheels and I do believe that probably the mental stimulation is as, is as important as the, yes. the nutrition. Mm -hmm. But how many times a day do they normally visit? Or is it just once a day? It is once a day for our Meals on Wheels program. Okay. Every day? Seven days a week? Monday through Friday. The program is provided Monday through Friday. Okay. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned before, Commissioner Stewart asked, how would someone sign up? And it sounds to me like right now your answer is call us, but you're on a waiting list and it's 400 people in front of you. Potentially. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty deflating. It is. Um, but you also said that you have somebody who evaluates. Mm -hmm. Do they evaluate? Do they evaluate? How, how, how do you separate the needy from the greedy? Sure. So one of the requirements from our state standards is they do have to have a home visit to make sure that they do qualify, meaning that they are mostly homebound. If they go to the doctors, if they go to church, that's one thing. But if they are able to get out, we're connecting them to our congregate program. But then there's a full gamut of questions that they are asking to find out what kind of support is available in the home, what is their, um, what is their medical uh, situation look like, what are their eating habits like. They are looking and in and talking to them about what food is available in the refrigerator, in their cupboards. Um, do they have any support from neighbors? Do they have other programs that they're working with? So that while I go out, I make sure that you do actually qualify for the program. And maybe I can't serve you right now, but let me see if there's any way I can connect you to some other services in the community. And that's where they're going to take that information and come back to the office and look and see with our information and assistance folks, or even with myself, what are the resources available that we might be able to support this person. What does an average meal cost? At five dollars and twenty-nine cents. Plus the transportation. So that's just for the physical meal itself. That is what we pay. Yeah, from the contractor. Mm -hmm. Okay, Commissioner Jones. Okay, just one. Yeah. Okay. When you speak of this waiting list, are we talking about in general, not just for your the food program, but you're talking about for these other programs as well, correct? That wait list is for my Meals on Wheels alone. I have a wait list for the in-home aid program. I have a short wait list for my home repair program. We've actually been. Uh, <coughs> blessed to get a number of additional grants to increase our ability to meet those needs much quicker. Um, but we do have wait lists for our other programs as well. Okay, that's what I was wondering about. I would assume that especially the in-home aid, I know individuals that a lot of people don't realize yes, Medicare, you know, they work, they're retired. Medicare doesn't cover it does not. CNAs, so I'm, I'm pretty sure you have a wait list in that area. Yes, ma'am. Yes, they don't cover that. You have to come out your pocket for that. You are correct. Yes, ma'am. But again, you know, with that in-home aid, if somebody is looking for some kind of support like that, we're going to see what other resources might be available in the community. Do they qualify for other programs? What respite programs are available to them? So that until we can come in as another program that can step in and help them out short term. Commissioner Stewart. Um, speaking of wait lists, I, um, 
your dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, I know I didn't say that right. I almost said Alzheimer's. Yes, um, but wait list on there as well? No. Okay, good, good. No, good. If you need a screening, good. if you want educational information, if you are looking for just answers to questions, how do I help my loved one who has dementia, give my office a call and I will be the one to speak actually with that individual or do that memory screening um, as soon as we can get you in our office. We also part with a, partner with a statewide organization called Dementia Alliance of North Carolina and pro provide music and memory at home kits. And there is no wait for those either. I still have funding available for some of those. Okay. So, okay. yes. So, so I will tell you that uh, uh, Assistant Manager Skeens is probably uh, always going here for stuff. And she was kind of glad I talked to uh, the Council of Older Adults because uh, I told you all I watch PBS. So they had a whole program on uh, dementia. and But it wasn't about dementia for the person. It was about training people uh, to be able to recognize it, to be able to help and be more patient uh, with that. I was going to bring it to the county, to all y'all, so y'all could, when these people come up and talk. Uh, and so I was talking to uh, uh, Ms. Hughes or uh, Council on the Drugs, but they partnered with uh, Mid Carolina, uh, COG, who has that uh, uh, ability to do. And so that training is for the community, for restaurants, for anybody in the community, where you see them, how you talk to them how we talk to them uh, with employees and everything. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to tap into that, that so you don't have to do any more work. Uh, but that was uh, excellent in terms of uh, some of the things that uh, I was impressed with that they uh, partnered with Mid Carolina, Better Health, United Way, and all of those other agencies. So many times people are in silos doing stuff, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is they if they can't do it, they try to refer out to another agency, and I think that's uh, that's uh, awesome. And uh, thank you so very much for coming and being able to provide that. Uh, I think it's uh, important. People don't know what they don't know, so uh, thank you for that information. Thank you. Thank you all so very much for letting me come and speak today. I appreciate thank you it. so much. Good job. Thank you. That will take us for the uh, consideration. Uh, that was, I knew how old Commissioner Booth was, so I had to make sure he knew about these things. Uh, consideration of agenda items 2025. But you giving it to, I just gave you about, uh, uh, Commissioner Keith just the dementia part. Budget Chair is strategic initiative. I was talking to him the other day and he couldn't remember my name. So what am I doing? Mr. Manager. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Good afternoon. As part of the uh, budget submission, we're required to have a strategic plan or a budgetary strategic plan. And um, over the last couple of months, staff has de developed a strategic plan initiatives that we would like to include in this year's budget. The only caveat with it is, is that with the GFOA submission, it has to be approved not adopted, but approved by the Board of County Commission. And I'll explain a little bit at the end the difference between the two. Okay, so what we did is we started out with the broad mission, vision, and values of the organization that we already have implemented. And we put that into a, a circle and like a clock and we wanted to first start off with the healthy and safe community. You can see the initiatives that we currently have that we already, but we just haven't formulated and put it in one concise document. Health and safe community, health and well-being and social services, diversity, equity, and inclusion, justice services, public safety. Then next, we want to have quality governance, uh, engaged and accountable workforce, workforce uh, financial stewardship, uh, citizen engagement, effective technology, quality facilities, next sustainable growth, economic opportunity, housing, infrastructure, and planning. And then we come over to culture and recreation, library services, educational uh, services, and historical and cultural amenities. Lastly, we have environmental stewardship, which includes solid waste management, soil and water conservation, and public water. Under each one of these, we have initiatives and goals. Under healthy and safe community, we have the first goal is to improve the physical and mental circumstances of residents by connecting them to community resources to enhance their quality of life. But we're already doing that. We just broke ground 
on the homeless support center. So that would be, uh, we already had it, but we're just putting it in a, in a formalized document and goal. The second goal, also quality of life initiatives that promote a healthy and safe community. You think about the Healthy Conversations Program, the Maternal Mortality Program, those two programs fall there. Goal three, provide emergency public safety and justice services to our citizens in a timely manner and efficient, efficient manner. Our specialty courts fall under there. So we're taking what we already do and just putting a goal and an initiative uh, to it for the budget. Goal number two, or uh, initiative number two, quality governance, ensure and engage and account the workforce to provide exceptional service. Goal number two, perform analysis, forecasting, reporting, and ensuring effective stewardship of funds, the longevity of current and future county assets. You think about it, both our budget now and our financial statements are certified by the G uh, GFOA, Government Finance Officers Award Program. But Commissioner Boots was trying to get away a minute ago. And then goal, <laughs> goal number three, create opportunities for uh, people to see the value in the works of the county government we had career fairs, and then we're, we're modernizing and streamlining our application process so people that we do bring into the organization, we can move them fastly, fast through the uh, employment process. Under sustainable growth and, develop, and development, promote responsible and strategic countywide growth and enhance the infrastructure, us re redefining and, and modernizing our planning and development uh, ordinances and, 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 and zoning codes. We're following it there. Prime example is the subdevelopment ord ordinance. Uh, we need to have a different conversation about that after that. Yeah. Goal number two, increase the number of affordable housing units available for low, in low to moderate income citizens, it's both okay. Shaw Heights and Phoenix Place, and there's a potential new place that I just learned about that we'll bring uh, later on in a uh, closed session. Uh, goal number three, promote and support address Sustainable open space and farming, our Soldier to Ag program, and many of the trainings that Cooperative Extension currently does, that falls underneath that goal. Farmers Market. And the farm, well, coming back. Yep. It's just two. Farmers Market okay. can fall there, but. <coughs> okay, and then culture and recreation, embrace innovative, traditional, and transformational library services that support, encourage, and engage our diverse community trying to increase the number of citizens, residents that have library cards, and also Cafe West at West Regional Library. We're very, very close to having a ribbon cutting on that. Now, uh, facility, enhance facilities, develop policies, and conduct planning activities to foster diverse cultural and recreational opportunities. That goal, the first one would be the Crown Event Center. Secondly, the International Farmers Market. The Farmers Market can fall under this one, and could fall under the previous uh, uh, mission, but we felt like it would be better. How about Rose Park with all the fish and stuff? I'm coming next. Oh. You didn't give it to me in advance. I didn't really so. <laughs> in environmental stewardship, provide resources to manage waste responsibly, creating or building a transfer station for the Ann Street landfill, our Bellfield Mining Project, and then provide resources to address and prevent water contamination and promote the proper use of the land. Rose Pond, some of the things that we'll talk about later regarding water, um, and that would fall under environmental stewardship. So that's the ending of the presentation. The only reason why we put it in this format um, is because, like I said, it's required for the budget award. Uh, they're looking at that very stringently this fact this upcoming year. And we, after we got the award this first year, we don't want to submit it again. And they say, no, you can't have it. So this is really only for the budgetary, the budget. Uh, operationally, many of these things we've already, uh, you've already approved. We've already implemented. We've already moved forward. Just need you all to, um, if we can move it to the, the next meeting for approval. Uh, and then it just has to say that it's approved by the board. Anybody have any questions? Uh, if I could real quick. <laughs> I, I like what you're doing. Uh, everything seems to be able to fit under the umbrella of uh, one of these things, and these are always the things that are important. Um, one thing that, and I'm sure you could tuck it up under something, 
Mr. Manager, but um, you know, one of the things I said that uh, Commissioner Stewart, when she was the chair, is in today's world we have to think differently. You know, I, I didn't make that up. It's Steve Jobs. He used to say it all the time. You got to think differently because the old ways of doing things just don't work. And a lot of that has to do with county services. We always struggle with personnel. Um, how do we embrace the technology to be able to get the services that make it much easier for the citizen and to, to be um, to, to give an example is um, how can they pay their, their taxes online better? How, how can they, if they want to do an improvement to their home, how can they do that even quicker and, and, and be able to pay for it online and to be able to do a lot of that stuff um, to make, it, it will help with our personnel, it will help with convenience and efficiency and financing, I hope. I would say in the month of May, no later than the early mid part of June, we will have a county app that um, <laughs> employee, everyone, residents can use to pay their bills, um, apply for a job, and learn about uh, county services. Additionally, there's an initiative that will be in the budget also that will also provide um, greater flexibility for citizens to engage with the county and access information, pay bills, and it'll be right outside of some of the buildings. It'll be outside where? Some of the county buildings. Oh. For the record, I did not know that. I was not a software manager, but I've been asking for that type of technology for years. So, thank you. The, um, as we do that and, and do all of that is, uh, to embrace the different languages that are in the community too so that it's uh, uh is when you go on the website everything's just not in english i mean it, you know um but that you know you got spanish you got vietnamese we, you know we talk about the diversity in this community and i think we've got to embrace that too when we talk about all of that so if i can get a motion um uh to approve the strategic initiative and plan for the inclusion with the gfoa Budget award submission and put it on the consent agenda for April 15th. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chair. Second. I get a second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. That is unanimous. Thank one, you. One, one last item. I'd like to thank the budget staff and Sally Shutt for all their work in, in getting this created. Um, not to mention time periods, but Sally sent me a final copy of it last night at 1108. <laughs> 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 I wasn't no work that late. She was texting me lately. I don't know much she was doing that. She must have been asleep back then. All right. You did a half hour early today. <laughs> half hour, that's all. Uh, that will take us to use a bridge. Oh, she's walking up to access program, Mr. Manager. Yes, uh, we have a <laughs> $176,000 in bridge access program funds that we will request uh, approval for to move this agenda item to the next meeting. But there's some categories we would like to spend the money in. Dr. Jennifer Green, Public Health Director, will uh, present this item and answer any questions you may have. Good afternoon, Commissioners. As the manager noted, we have $176,347 in bridge access fund dollars. These are funds from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that get passed to us through uh, our state health department. The, the purpose of this funding is to maintain access of COVID-19 vaccines um, for uh, adults that are uninsured and underinsured. Uh, so uh, this board set the fees for those vaccines back in the fall. Um, and we have other programs that provide free vaccines for our, our children through the Federal Vaccines for Children program, but we don't currently have a program that provides uh, vaccines at no cost for adults. So these would be specifically for our COVID vaccines. Um, the allowable costs are in your packet. Um, they include the vaccine administration fee, which is $65 per injection, and then also the staff support. So that, those are the two items in which we're requesting to be able to use these funds for. We have two temporary staff that um, we have on board that help us to do our COVID vaccine outreach event. Um, for example, I'll take the point.
point of privilege to give you an example of one of those events. This Saturday, we're doing our Vax Your Pet, Vax Yourself event. We'll be offering COVID vaccines. Um, and so they do um, much of our public-facing outreach events around COVID. Um, the other items, items C through E in your packet, um, edu uh, funding educational materials, media, operational costs, vaccine refrigerators, vendor costs, computer software. We have other COVID-19 dollars that we've already utilized to cover the cost of items C through E. So we're requesting to use these funds um, to be able to support um, the staff, the two temporary staff that we have, and then to cover the vaccine cost uh, up to $65 um, uh, per injection. So we're requesting this be put on the agenda for Monday. If I can get a motion to approve the bridge access fund to support COVID-19 vaccine administration fees and support two temporary nurses positions. So Can I ask a question? Real quick, why are we, are, are we restricted by the grant to just cope? I mean, we haven't had a, a fatality specifically with COVID in a long time. We're going to bring two people. But there, there might be another thing down the road, right? You know, the, the avian bird flu, which you'll be responsible for yes. if, it comes in, if it comes in to Cumberland County. You know, um, you know, flu vaccines, you know, everybody gets sick on different. Is there any flexibility or does it have to be? COVID. Uh, the, the waiving the fee for the vaccine has to be COVID. Mm -hmm. The staff, we um, work hard to partner that with other vaccines that we're administering. So for example, if the, during on Saturday they're doing our outreach event and we will provide COVID vaccines, we're also providing back to school immunizations. So they can, oh. they can administer both of those vaccines, but we have to make sure that they're also administering and offering COVID vaccines while they're doing that work. Offering. Yes, and, and we will administer those too. Um, but we have to, so for example, in the fall, we do our back to school immunization clinics with Cumberland County Schools. We offer and provide COVID vaccines. Those staff will help with those events while we are also providing back to school immunizations. Okay, thank you. But the injection fee has to be for COVID. All right, Commissioner Booth. I know you told me this, but I've forgotten. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about the pneumonia and the RSV stuff? Is that offered through y'all as yes. reduced or free? Okay. Um, so the RSV vaccine, um, we cobble together the money through other federal programs to be able to provide that at no cost um, for um, adults. The RSV vaccine season is winding down, so we no longer have RSV vaccines for our pregnant women. Um, we'll start that again in September, and the same thing for our infants. We'll start that again in September. Those are covered through um, they either slide to zero based on income or it's covered by insurance, and then our adults over the age of 65 will be able to get those uh, either through their health insurance or the get it through um, other federal programs that are available. So that, that one has a, a varying number of programs that they cover the cost of the RSV vaccine. And is the same like uh, getting out the word network used in all of them? We do. So that like, like I'd probably be more inclined instead of taking my child in for the school vaccine and that's the only thing. Uh, you know, Jim wants to go play golf or something. Uh, if, if I get some brownie points for my wife by taking her and getting my pneumonia vaccine or something or you know what I mean it's just I think the more you can kind of move it together that way we don't have to call for a ride yes um, you know. that, that's exactly right so we try to do that where based on the based on the audience to making sure that we're providing multiple vaccines. So if we're doing COVID vaccines, we're also providing RSV vaccines. If we're doing back to school immunizations, we're also providing COVID vaccines. So we're, because one of those vaccines is going to pull you in, and then we're going to offer the other one to you as well while we're there. Well, the ones that where people go, they say that your folks are excellent staffers. They are. They're, they're very good. Yeah. They go, they go okay, thank you. And you go, is that it? Yep. They, 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 they don't. That was nothing. Yes. They were very good at that. Did you get your that. single shot? Uh, not the second one. Oh, you need to get the second one. You get your single yeah. shot, yes. They have stopped my, me and my child many times, so <laughs> they are very good. All those in favor, that's unanimous. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I guess the next one is the lease renewal for the JE card. I guess these folks getting ready for the reevaluation in terms of going up on the dollar bill. All right. Mr. Manager. Amanda Bailey, uh, <laughs> General Manager for the Natural Resources Group, will present this item and answer any questions you may have. Yes, so the Solid Waste Department operates the container site located on Macedonia Church Road, and the lease is from Clitter Carter Hart. 
and um, she has asked for an increase of six thousand dollars or actually um, all um, or I'm sorry it's a two thousand dollar increase for a total amount of six thousand dollars for five years and that's what we have been paying in every lease renewal uh, six thousand dollars for the entire for five years yes no is it six is six thousand a year for the entire five years six thousand wow. dollars is so, what Okay, so it's a thousand dollars a month. A thousand dollars a year. A year. A year. A year. A year. No. Oh, yeah. it, we paid them at the beginning of the five-year interval or lump sum. Hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, uh, anybody got any questions? We should do approve. Approve uh, the lease renewal. Uh, and authorize the chairman to execute the attached lease agreement that has been pre-ordered and determined to be legally sufficient. We've got a motion and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. That will take us to the contract amendment for the landfill gas ex system expansion. Yes. So um, we are required by our Title V permit to install gas collection and control systems. Um, and we have previously awarded a contract um, for sale nine to um, to provide um, gas wells in cell nine of the landfill. Um, and we're at coming back to you um, to ask to for more money to increase um, unit quantities uh, for this gas contract because since the contract was awarded, uh, the height of the landfill is increased. And we're also looking um, to replace uh, the blower that goes to Cargill. Um, we are having some reliability issues with that blower. Uh, we did uh, ask for a bid for this blower improvement at the time of bids and did not choose to award it. Um, but we're asking now to um, add that into this change order. And also we're asking for some manifold line for some, um, for some gas wells. And so our contract is, is with Advance One Development. They have been performing the work at the landfill. Um, and we're asking to increase these quantities and um, increase the change order. The, the change order, the total contract amount is would be $940,683.37. That is keeping the unit prices from the original bid amount. We're just increasing quantities. So, so basically, it, I, it's three things we're doing, I guess. I, I'm trying to figure it out. Yes, so sir. One is the contract with advanced development. Uh, we already have that form. contract. So it says, so that contract's already done? Yes, this is a change uh, order to increase quantities for linear feet of wells and also to um, replace a blower and also to add manifold footage to connect the wells. So we're asking for it. So the original contract amount was for $616,000 right. mm -hmm. and we're asking to increase the total contract to $940,000. So, so you're not asking for $940,000. No, you ask for, can somebody give me the difference? That's what we're asking for. Okay, yes. yeah, so, so I'm asking That's what I was reading for the, no, um, I'm sorry, I don't mm -hmm. have that uh, difference. It's, I um, it, I, it was $182,000, $182,900. $148.37 for the blower and for the unit price adjustments it's $141,250 and so the total price increase is $324,198.37. That's what the, okay, that's what they ask because I needed to know. Uh, Commissioner Keith, how much, are we getting, how much are we getting from Cargill for the next thing? So the month the monthly amount we get from Cargill depends on what as, they... As last year, uh, we were asking for almost a million dollars to to capture methane. Yes. To and sell so, it to them. Yes. Are they paying us over a million dollars? Um, so they have not in the past year. Um, gas prices are down. But I also want to emphasize this is not just about gas sales. This is also about gas compliance and our Title V permit with EPA. And the construction of the wells 
is entirely for compliance. The um, 182,000 is for a blower replacement to go to Cargill. Um, I think we budgeted in revenues this year. Uh, we have not met budget for revenues this year. Um, I, I don't want to tell you the number. I, I think I know the number, but it's it is not where we had hoped when we um, originally signed the gas contract. We've seen gas prices anywhere on the order of eight to nine dollars per MMBTU, and recently we're seeing the gas prices on the order of two dollars per MMBTU. So the prices can vary. Widely. And now, you have asked about gas value over and over, and um, and we hear you, and we are preparing. We have been talking about um, options to present to you later about gas value. So we're working on some numbers for you. I guess my thing is, it's an enterprise fund, so you can't lose this money in the enterprise fund because it's out of the enterprise fund. So uh, I don't know when the contract with Cargill is up. Is whether we, if it's got, the, it's going to have that volatility, then you've got to have something. We need to have something in that contract that goes with that volatility. From well, there's a lot down to two dollars. It's just we, we, we're coming up on, on the. It's, it's October 2026, and we um, we have been working on several fronts um, in terms of gas. Um, everything from the county uh, looking at developing uh, a more robust gas collection system and gas production system to um, a public-private partnership and um, we have been discussing these options on a very conceptual level in anticipation of the gas contract renewal which we have to notify Cargill six months before. There's a lot of things kind of coming together at this time. One of those things is um, the bipartisan infrastructure law um, that brings in some funding for um, gas systems, um, which would allow the county to be able to develop some of their own capital cost with grant dollars potentially, rather than us having to go to a third party developer. And so that's kind of a, new, a development we've been tracking from the very beginning. We've been providing comments to DEQ, um, and, and we are going to come back to you with, with a gas value analysis. With so what we have here is the, and this is uh, funding that's available within the solid waste budget to approve that contract amendment with advanced one development and allow the chairman to execute the contract on behalf of the county. If I can get a motion. Second. If I can get a second. Second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. No, it's not. I'm sorry. Voting in favor of the chair. I just ask my last question. Oh, go ahead and ask the last question. But we're going to go ahead Ms. Batter. Batter. I've, you're, you're the fourth solid waste director that I've asked this question to, the second attorney, the fourth engineer, Methane gas has always been something that we did not we did not maximize to, to where, as we understood, it, before you came here, we missed some opportunities with other clients who were willing to pay because we are locked into contracts with other agencies even before Cardio. All I want to do is make sure that the county is getting the best return that they possibly can and we're not locked into an, a, a contract it doesn't I understand completely compliance you have to get rid of your methane gas somehow I destroy it yes right. yes or get rid of it. But, but hopefully if there is a market out there and if the market goes up and down then we should be compensated as the market goes the volatility and we, we're, our contract now says they get everything and we don't have any option to sell any of our stuff anywhere else that was my only concern all of those in favor of <laughs> It wasn't a question, it was just a statement. <laughs> All of those in favor? Unanimous. All right, thank you. Uh, that would take us to the Art Committee recommendation and associate budget. Yes, um, Ty Wall, Chief of Staff, will present the recommendation from the April 1st Art Committee meeting. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. 
Um, so I'm here today to present uh, recommendations from the American Rescue Plan Committee. Um, the following items have been moved forward by the committee and are presented today for the board's consideration. Um, it's three items. The first one is a, we're, we're, we are requesting consideration for the approval of 17 um, nonprofit assistance pro, uh, program applications at a cost of $435,665. Um, the second item um, is a, uh, a request for um, funding at a $500,000. Um, for a Cumberland County Internship Program and the Associated Budget Ordinance Amendment, which is B24114112, and also a request to transfer uh, the remaining unencumbered funds from the Small Business Program um, as unallocated funds into the General Fund as free of capacity. And the committee is requesting that these funding recommendations be forwarded to the April 15, 2024 Board of Commissioners meeting as items of consent. I will go to uh, the chair of that committee, Commissioner Keith. You got anything you want to add to that? Just brief. Uh, briefly. <laughs> I, I, will, I, I will say that we have a very engaged committee. We have drilled down very deeply in all of this. I, I got to congratulate you guys on the internship program. I think that is going to be an amazing program for us to help uh, young people become in, in county government. So uh, I'd like to make the motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. I would tell you that um, uh, we also, uh, with Ty, uh, Mr. Vaught, that um, I was at uh, one of the meetings the other day uh, with the county, with county governments, um, and I want them to know, and I, uh, and I said it in the meeting, uh, because everybody's moving their money over to uh, the general fund, that that came from Cumberland County, that, that uh, Mr. Vaught felt that out, and now everybody's using it. Uh, and so. Uh, there's a motion. All of those in favor? Unanimous. All right. Thank you. Uh, oh, this is the interim. The request to increase the maximum amount of aid per house. Uh, the interim county uh, community development director. Mr. Manager. You didn't know Yeah, that. I saw uh, Ty switching hats, so he's uh, community, interim community development director. He has uh, uh, the request to increase the amount per, for repairs for the whole program. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Um, so today I bring before you an important matter to regard the Minor Housing Repair Grant Program. Um, back on December 19, 2016, this board made a pivotal decision to increase that max cap from $7,500 to $10,000. Um, that change was propelled by the growing financial assistance needs among homeowners in the community. Um, this is especially critical for those who are AMI or adjusted uh, median income, 80%. Um, the, the program fully managed by the county not only provides financial grants, but also offers a holistic report approach to housing repair needs. I mean, this includes assessments, contract or procurement, project oversight, and ensuring that the funds are directly addressed, um, are directly addressing the most pressed repair needs in the community. Um, since 2016, um, there's been dramatic rise in building materials costs and labor. Um, these changes have strained our program's capacity to meet the growing demand for housing rehab highlighting the urgency for an updated grant threshold that mirrors the current market realities. Um, the fixed grant amount, unchanged since 2016 again, now falls short of covering the actual cost of necessary home repairs, uh, putting the program's effectiveness at risk. Um, given the county's uh, comprehensive role in this program, from initial assessment to final project management, it's imperative that we reassess and adjust the grant amount. And this adjustment will not only ensure the sustainability of the program, but also enhance the responsiveness to the evolving needs of the community. And so today, staff is recommending that the board increase the limit for the minor housing repair grant program from $10,000 to $30,000, and are requesting that this be forwarded to the April 15, 2024 Board of Commission meeting as items of consent. Mr. Vaughn, for $30,000, my baby go buy a house. If you're going to put that kind of money to rehab a house, I, that, I'm, okay, I'm going to go to Commissioner uh, Boos. I think he had his hand up, and then... How, is that going to deplete the available funds by three times? I mean, are we, are we going to, like, eliminate two-thirds of the people we can help a little bit by picking out a few and helping a lot? You know what I'm saying? What's, is it, is, what's the future on the cash flow of this? No, sir, I don't, I don't, that's not an issue. What, what we're running into is, um, so on the 1st, when we, we present the, the slideshow for Community Development Week, a lot of the homes that you saw on that slideshow were minor repair homes. And so circa 2018, we were able to, for example, do 
a repair on a roof and also a HVAC repair, and it came in at like seven thousand dollars. We're not even able to work on HVAC for less than uh, less than ten thousand at this point. And so, what's happened is the program funds are not moving because we're not able to meet the capacity needs of what the what the the cost of building materials and supplies are now. So you can't do anybody because you ain't got enough money at, the, at that capacity level. So as opposed to expending it, it's not and it's just sitting there. It's kind of what I'm getting. Right, and also, um, and because of that, we have a lot of funds that are being carried over from program year to program year, and also, uh, community development has a threshold we must meet the one and a half, and one and a half percent of our allocation annually. That, and also, you know, we're looking to try to meet that threshold as well. Um, I think you need to call Miss Hughes over here, Council of Agents. There you go, right there. Yeah, that, that, that witness take care of that witness over there. Jack, yes, sir. Um, Commissioner Keith. So, well, one of the, the, the issues on there is the deciding authority who does this as the community development. There, there were things where we were investing in houses that were that was over 50% of the value of the house, even with these smaller numbers. You know, what is the criteria for someone being approved for these? Because we've all heard the stories too. I, in the middle of them, where you might get a contractor out there and it's a contractor that's been used before and they realize that you're not really bidding this thing out, you know, um, uh, the prices, you know, when, when, when money's easy, the prices go up, right? So is, who's the deciding factor? If, if we're going to go $30,000, which is a huge jump, but I you know you can't do a bathroom for $10,000 right. in a nice house anymore. Um, but who's the who's the approving authority for thirty thousand dollars? So it would it would be uh, it would be the the uh, on the de on the side of the department. What I will say about that is we do have um, construction. Um, uh, uh, construction coordinators within the department, and they are actually working. Um, uh, they are trained, and they're at pricing also, and at um, at pricing. And so, when they go into a home, they're looking at what the needs are for the homeowner. They're looking, and they are. They also know what things cost. And so, when they put together that scope of work and that work write up, and they and they go to bid that project out, they already have an idea of what it costs because they've looked at what's needed to be done, and they put that in the work write up. And so, we we know what our we know, in a, in, a, in a sense, what realistic numbers are going into the, bid, the bidding process. Okay. Commissioner Stewart. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Stewart. So when, when, when they go into this home, are they looking to do a project or the house is the entire project? They're, so they're they're looking they're looking um, holistically and comprehensively at everything and so this th there are there are two different programs for the house and rehab and so there's what we call a full and a minor and so the full which this is not the full but the full process we're looking at the the value of the home we're looking at home equity that is a that ends up being a deferred forgivable loan for them. So that is tied, there's a, there's a lien on that, based on that. The grant program, this, this minor house repair program, used to be called the emergency repair program. And so these are these are the things that are um, impacting health and safety. And so, you know, uh, people, mold, you know, those types of things when you get in there. Or, um, and it's typically in the criteria, you have elderly individuals, people who are low to moderate income, who could not make these repairs for emergency purposes others, otherwise, basically. Commissioner Booth. This is probably like a question for Rick. Is there, I know this whole thing about, everyone gets caught up on this bidding stuff and has to be to the, the, the lowest responsible bidder. So I've been in the middle of all that, finding out that people were the lowest, but I can always show they're not the most responsible. We had Shula Ferris, when they did Jack Britt, uh, did such a good job there, they won awards for it before it was even built, uh, and design awards. Uh, and so we kind of, we didn't really do anything wrong, but we kind of told them what we had coming down the pike. And so they could actually start getting ready, because they did, I mean, they lived here. So they knew that, that, that all they had to do was attend the school board meeting and see we were going to be adding on to, you know, Tony, you know, elementary or something, and and so they would start getting their bids together, and by kind of feeling like they were, and us kind of making them feel like they were going to be, uh, they've been checked off, no problems, You're going excellent to do quality, and so I'm just trying to get, can we get, and we have to bid off each one of these little things, or can we do something to where if we find the 
a company that's father and son thing that does masonry work. And that they, they don't want to do the whole house. Can we get somebody that gets like the masonry work for a similar neighborhood? We're going to go into a, uh, like, he's, he mentioned the word Shaw Heights a little bit ago. If there's somebody that can go in instead of having to bid out every little house in there at $5,500 and somebody's willing to take, yeah, someone's willing to take the whole street or something or the whole subdivision at 4000 they're making money and we're not having to mess around 5500 and my favorite thing, change orders. Mr. Attorney. The, these, these are all done pursuant to HUD regulations and, and my, I, I, I want to research that more fully, but my experience has been that it, it has to be a single contractor that, that, that does a, a house. Um, I, I, I can research it. So I, I guess the question would be, but, but these, are people, 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 uh, these, these are all small formal bids. These just small small companies too. This is not a formal bid process, and, and there's about used to be about seven companies. I've made, made and narrowed down some now of, of small local businesses that that pretty much exclusively do yeah. this work. Well, again, and I guess even if you look at the city, is as you look at that. Uh, look at it is whether you can just qualify a certain number of businesses and then you go down the list. I don't know. You check that out. Commissioner Jones. He answered my question. You know, okay. see the difference with the, uh, right. when it comes to the minor repairs and the full house. Thank you. Yes, sir. Oh, I did. Thank you. You brought something up to me. So on the uh, full house where you said it's a uh, forgivable loan. Yes, sir. Is the lien on there unless they sell it and then we get ours back, or how, how long did that last? So I get you to come in here, fix up my house, and I turn around and sell it. Uh, is there, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, they don't matter whichever one, but I mean, I come in here and get my $30,000, build my house up, and I can now sell it for more than, than what it was. Their, their, their income requirement, HUD income requirements for that. the owners, and the, the, the um, income eligible owner has to remain in the house or the, or the loan is called, has, has to be paid off. To the end, to the die, the Well, it's, okay. yeah, okay. they're usually 15 years and, okay. and, and, okay. and, okay. and very, very few of them, make sure. okay. and very few of them are not forgiven full, out fully. Right. Mm -hmm. and, if, and the loan can be, the loan can be passed down one time. So like if a parent is in a home and if they pass, the child comes in, okay. it can be passed one time. So, so they are, is only forgivable after 15 years? No, they're usually 15 year terms and they're forgiven every month. I mean, basically, it's, 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 it's a proration. As long as, as the uh, an income eligible occupant, the owner, you know, owner is in the house, uh, they, they typically uh, get kicked out because the, it's an elderly person that started and dies before the 15 years is up. And then so, a lot of times there is an income eligible heir that inherits an interest in the house and, and, it, and it can be continued, but it's occasionally that there's not. So, so I guess I ask this question because it, it because of uh, Commissioner Boots and I do this uh, lawyer stuff. So uh, you go in, you have an elderly person, they ain't 15 years, they have to get moved to a senior living place and the house has to get sold. Do we get ours back from? We do the house back. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure. That one's there's, 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 there's a recorded deed of trust release. Okay. Commissioner Stewart. If the if they don't meet the requirements anymore, say they were fortunate enough to get a job and get out of that tax bracket that they were in, then who determines what their what their okay. the cost is going to be the next month? Well, they, they do an annual uh, community development does a, an annual review of, of eligibility. Frankly, I've been here for 14 years looking at these, and we've never had that happen. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Okay. We can move to uh, motion to move that from 10 to 30. So moved. Yes, second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you so much. Uh, that will take us to uh, the attorney on the uh, minimum housing and non residential building code. And, and this is just the start of, of the process, and we'll try to move on as quickly as possible. But uh, I want to add a new provision for uh, abandoned structures to the minimum housing code that, that just became something we could do since chapter 160D was, was done. And it would, a lot of the thing, about all the things that, that come to the Board of Commissioners or will be coming now are abandoned structures. And, and, and the Chair and Vice Chairman were particularly concerned about the uh, hotel uh, costly in the end that 
is in a partial state. I mean, the windows have been removed and stuff like that. That was done by the owner, but it's just been, that process has stopped. Uh, this, this, in my opinion, would be the most efficient way to address something like that. It gives us the same process as minimum housing, which is much, even though it's slow, it's much better than a nuisance abatement action in Superior Court. And, I'm, and this is the yeah. start. And, and, and I thank you for this, and we, we make this motion, but have you looked at, because uh, I bet your ordinance has been in effect for whatever period of time, whether it can be streamlined, if there's any new statutes I'm, that came along. That's the reason. I'm looking at the whole thing. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, so if we can get a, a motion to approve the finding and the purpose for amending the county minimum housing and non-residential building code Certainly as set forth in the attachment and direct the county attorney to draft the necessary amendment. Certainly ask to go to consent. Second. Uh, it's been moved and second. All those in favor? Unanimous. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Manage. Uh, one other item of business. I uh, want to inform everyone, employees, that on uh, Monday, April the 15th, the farmers of Employee pharmacy will be back to four hours uh, starting on Monday. And I'd like to thank uh, Timmy Kiwa, Brian Haney, um, Heather Skeens, and Dr. Green for their work and uh, getting this back open. Is it closed now? How many employees? How many employees? 2162 right now. Oh, for you mean for the pharmacy? Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's budget season. I know. I know. Right. There are. Um, I think. I think seven. So, Are we part time? Well, I made an approval for one today, so I'll bring it to eight. We are hiring a host of the part time pharmacist, the 30 hour pharmacist that was vacant. Um, that has gone live, um, and right now there are no part time, but we are using some temp assistance to, uh, to get it going quickly while we finish the recruitment. Okay. We'll be happy with okay. the next child clearance. All right. That takes us just to other items. Um, yesterday, uh, just to mention that the um, uh, Michael Regan, Secretary of EPA, came down to announce the new um, uh, limits on uh, PFAS and um, forever chemicals and uh, I guess on the infrastructure um, over a billion dollars to be able to get in here. And uh, so uh, as, as we were sitting out there listening to him, uh, I was talking to the manager, I guess I emailed the manager, he said, Sally's on it already. So, uh, to get out part of our, uh, if we can get in in that $1 billion that they, they came down. Uh, we got the monthly reports. You saw it, the health insurance, the financial report, the project uh, updates. If uh, there are no other things, I ask, take a motion to go into closed sessions pursuant to GS 143-318-11, paragraphs 3 and 5. I can get a motion. So, get a second. Second. We we'll moved and uh, uh, second to go in the closed session. All those in favor? Unanimous. And if you, uh, while we clear the room, we'll be back at 225.
and we're back in open session. Um, does, uh, if I can get a motion to adjourn? So. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> All those in favor? That's you, Unanimous. All right, thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for uh, the work you did today. Bye.